feel free to – oh, thank you. Yep. Thanks for the response. It's great. I, um, I'll go ahead and get started then. So first I just want to thank Mickey for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, hopefully I can share some information on that, um, how precision – how GIS is used in some of the John Deere products and just within the precision ag um, industry today. So. As, as Mickey mentioned, if you have any questions as we go or you, or you want to stop or, or clarify anything, please type it in the chat and I'll, I'll try to elaborate. But that's why I, I think the poll was, was really important um, to kind of get an understanding of, of the background um, and, and maybe how much experience those of you may have in ag. Um, and I'll try to explain a few things uh, a little bit more um, as, they, as they relate to agriculture specifically. So, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so today uh, in, our, in the presentation, I'm going to go over a few items and just wanted to give you a quick overview of what we'll talk about today. I'll first give an overview of who, who am I and then talk about John Deere Intelligent Solutions Group. That's the group that I work for. Um, and talk about some of the precision ag products at John Deere. And then examples of how we do data collection in the field, in the cab. And then also examples of how we do um, in office, once you're back in the office, analysis of the data, the spatial data that you've collected. And then I'll talk about some standards efforts in the ag industry that are currently ongoing to kind of help standardize how some of these data, and especially spatial data formats, are exchanged throughout the industry. So I'll go ahead and get started. So who am I? Um, as Mickey mentioned, my name's Jill Stanford. I'm a spatial data architect at John Deere. And so um, just kind of added a timeline here to give you a little of my background. So um, I was actually born and raised here in Iowa. And to be honest, I probably, uh, you know, I was born and raised on a farm in southwest Iowa. We raised livestock and row crop corn and soybeans. And I honestly probably thought I'd never end up back in the ag industry. So. Um, when I went to school, I went to school for geography and computer science. This is before there was a lot of GIS type programs. So I took, you know, a, a major in geography and minor in computer science and, and did a lot of programming to actually, you know, make some of the GIS routines work uh, in systems. And, and uh, whoops, actually I've got a comment that there are, are there slides I'm seeing a black, blank white screen in the share window. Is anyone able no, um, if you continue to have problems, I guess let us know. It should be on a timeline slide. Okay, looks like everybody can see them now. So there's an arrow in the middle of the slide that says timeline. And basically just kind of going through, you know, my background is, is has been GIS um, throughout my professional career. So um, did, you know, some internships at Census Bureau and National Geographic and um, my research um, thesis was actually through the University of Nebraska, but in Roatan, Honduras, doing remote sensing for coral reefs. So did a lot of work, um, you know, within remote sensing and GIS early on, and then worked in transportation, GIS, at Lynx in Orlando, and then worked for space imaging, which soon got bought out by Digital Globe, um, and then um, became the GIS director at DTS. And so, um, in 2006, I was looking to, my husband and I, to move back to Iowa. So in 2006, I actually accepted a position at John Deere with AMS at the time, which was very small, um, less than 100 people when I started here in 2006 and, and um, has grown significantly since. And so and when I started at, at uh, John Deere, I was quite surprised that there was um, quite a bit of GIS type work going on in Precision Ag. And I'll go through some of that today. But, so just in general, you know, moved back to Iowa, um, now working in, in GIS in ag, and um, recently bought a farm of my own and, and helping our family farm. So, so I've kind of gone through some different roles within um, what's now ISG here at John Deere, from both our desktop software that does GIS to our in-cab mapping, and I'll show you some of that today. So now I'm in a role of a, of a data architect, and we look at sort of how spatial data moves throughout our system, from data that's collected in the cab to data that's then um, presented or used in the office. So I will go through some of that with you today. 
So just the next section here, I'll give a quick overview of John Deere, what we call ISG or Intelligent Solutions Group. Um, to the customer, it's ag management solutions, but we do more than just um, data collection for ag. We also have construction and forestry, so that's why the group is actually called IS. All the information that I'm going to share today can also be found on deer.com, and then there's a couple links in this slide deck as well to ag management solutions and John Deere farm site. So everything I'll show you today, you can also go back and, and get some more material later if you'd like. And then talking about the John Deere farm site, we won't show it today because it's I think over um, a couple minutes long at least. But it kind of gives you at least the vision of where John Deere is going with um, sharing and making agronomic data accessible to our customers. So what I'm going to talk about today are some of the key elements that um, that we want to bring to the customer and that we're you know delivering to customer with with these solutions and. And the, the keys are wireless communication, some remote support, and some of the in-field hardware. And that really gets into what a, a lot of what I'll talk to you all today about what it takes to make some of these systems work. So the hardware involved with GPS and, and the data collection in the field. So overall, our goal is to gather and access data about machines and fields. And you'll kind of see this from the picture here on the right. Um, the idea is that we want intelligent, automated equipment to bring more precision and convenience and essentially more uptime to our machines and our equipment um, that's being used in, in farming operations. And so this picture um, illustrates it um, fairly well in terms of what we're trying to do with FarmSite. There's machines in the field doing operations. You've got a combine here that um, is communicating with a grain cart, for example, and then that information is being sent to the office and um, a sprayer here communicating with another sprayer so that they don't spray the same area twice, for example, but ultimately sending that data back to the office so that the office, um, the, the, those in the office can make decisions about the operations and also sort of monitor some of the work that's going on and then support as they need from the office as well. So, so I'm going to start this off by talking about some of the in-cab data collection, and we'll talk about some of the hardware that's used for uh, that enables some of this technology. So first I'll start, start talking about our GPS receivers and displays. So one thing um, to note, and again, you can get information from our, our website as well, but um, John Deere AMS and, and ISG, we actually manufacture and, and deliver the software for these products, for most of these products. So you'll see the, this um, GPS receiver here, that's, um, the software is, is developed here at ISG. And then in the cab, the touch screen displays, we um, have engineers that write the software for the displays as well. So I'll go through some of the details for each of these. So the Starfire receiver, this is our most recent receiver. It's the Starfire 3000. And with the Starfire 3000, it's a 66-channel, multi-frequency, differential, GNSS receiver. Um, you'll see them mounted. If you look, if you start looking at uh, John Deere equipment, you'll see a yellow globe, a yellow dome at the top of some equipment. If you see that, it's probably precision ag enabled, and it's probably collecting some of this precision ag data. So once you get one of those receivers, there's different levels of spatial accuracy that you can in, in act, that you can activate for that receiver. And um, the little graph here at the top um, shows you a, a graphic of the different levels. So some one level of accuracy is, is WAS. That's you know the basic um, GPS accuracy that you would get from most receivers. We also add in another level called SF1 and SF2. And this is from what's called our Starfire Network. So several years ago, John Deere bought a company called Navcom, and we have a um, set of base stations that are available throughout um, the world, around the globe. That actually helps us provide um, higher, better, better um, corrections and, and higher accuracy within our, our GPS signal. Um, and so the correction, so the signals themselves, I should mention that this particular receiver, the Starfire 3000, has both GPS and GLONASS now, so we're getting both um, 
corrections. And then also um, for just out of the box, the customer will get SF1, which is about nine inches from pass to pass. So you can think about if a customer is driving down the field or a grower is driving through their field and then they turn the wheel and they come back, um, make a second pass through the field, that will be plus or minus um, nine inches. So there's a little bit of, of um, difference between those two. And so what a lot of customers will do is, is an activation of what's called SF2, and that gives us two centimeters um, pass to pass accuracy. And then, oops, sorry, I'll go back one more here. For um, one additional thing that we have within the receiver is IMU that gives us terrain compensation. So we have roll, pitch, and yaw. And there's some, some images on the screen here that, that show why that might be important, at least for a precision ag um, application in a lot of areas. Um, of course, the field isn't completely flat. And so what we do have to take into consideration is um, driving along a field, and especially with this very large equipment, um, the receiver itself, you know, we have, to, we have to manage that roll, pitch, and yaw so that we truly have pass-to-pass -pass, um, accuracy. So with that, um, that's all within the receiver itself. There's an additional um, signal correction called RTK. And that is um, available from either a grower or producer can purchase their own base station. And so what you see in this picture here is a tripod. And, it, and there's another set of hardware. I haven't added any details on this um, just from a time perspective, but it's certainly out on the website you can go look at. But essentially, by adding this um, RTK receiver in the field, we add another level of correction. And that base station will give you plus or minus one inch accuracy. It's actually sub-inch. It's within centimeters, but um, this is, this is, there's two different ways to get at this. So again, you can either have your own base station to get that correction, or our John Deere dealers, many of the dealers actually have their own dealer-owned RTK network, and you can go out to different John Deere dealer um, websites or to the dealers themselves, and a lot of times they will have, this is an example of a coverage map that a, a dealer has on their website. And what they do is they actually mount this RTK base station on the top of a very large tower, and they get um, some buffer distance from that tower location. They, get, they will emit a correction signal from that tower. And so many customers purchase an RTK activation from the dealer so that they can get repeatable accuracy um, within their operations. And so um, the, the Part of the operation of using that tower um, in part of the setup for data collection, you actually choose what tower you will use and, and, and your operations will reference that tower. Jill, um, one question here from Mary. It was, uh, so NAVCOM is equals cores for the base station. And cores, so I, I, I should probably yeah, clarify. Cores is a, a network of like base stations, um, and I think basically the idea is I think she's asking is Navcom basically doing kind of the same thing for you where Navcom gives you the ability to have these your own base stations basically. Got you. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. So they're um, controlled base stations that we um, reference and survey. You know, as there is a if there's plate tectonic movement or or something happens. They're actually controlled base stations around the world. That's exactly right. And, and actually on that page, um, you can go out to our Stellar Support website, um, tools and calculators that didn't show up very well, but it's GPS and Starfire um, status. And they'll give updates or global events that happen around the world. Um, and you can actually hourly, I took that picture this morning and it's not coming across very well, but you can see each of the, the base stations for SF2 and um, the base stations that we're using for the Starfire network. And you can get, whoops, I'm highlighting it here. I did that wrong. But you can get a updated status of um, that, that station itself. So they are, the Starfire is, you know, keeping an eye on, on the accuracy continually. Good question. Thank you. 
So that's, um, I guess, the, the end of the, at least the receiver side of things. So the next part I wanted to talk about was the in-cab data collection and the display in-cab that we use to actually collect some of this data. So the, the product I'll talk about today is the Green Star 3, the GS3. And this is a touch screen display that is, you can think of it as a, um, it's an embedded display that actually comes in base with certain makes and models of our, of our equipment. So similar to when you buy a car, if you buy a car with a, with a certain um, platinum make and model, it probably comes in base with maybe a touch screen navigation or a, a touch screen display. It's similar to ag equipment, um, or at least for John Deere, it's similar to um, our equipment sales. Certain self-propelled sprayers, for example, come with this in, in the cab and are used for operations. And um, certain makes and models of tractors and combines, for example, will come with this. If it doesn't, you can actually buy it off the shelf or not off the shelf, but um, as a factory option and, and move it from machine to machine. So it is a, a universal type product that you can move from one piece of equipment to the other. It's a ruggedized display, so um, you know, it, it withstands extreme temperature variations, which we have often in our operations, very warm conditions and extremely cold conditions. And then also, um, of course, there's a lot of dust in this environment, and so it's very ruggedized to um, withstand a lot of that environment. So what we do is the, the display itself is connected to what's called a CAN, the vehicle network that provides information to the display. And so some of that information is like we talked about GPS earlier. The GPS receiver publishes information like lat long or your position. And that's something that this display picks up from that vehicle network. Other information that it picks up from the vehicle network are things like yield information. So sensor information from our equipment. In this example in the upper right hand corner, I'm showing, um, Oops, I seem to have lost the connection. Did you do you see the connection still, Mickey? Yes. I think I must have dropped out, but I can still talk to the slide anyhow. Um, so in the upper right hand corner, I'm showing the the yield data coming in, and with the yield data, it actually is is capturing information from a sensor. So an example of this might be a combine. In the in the upper way upper right hand corner, there you see a yellow spout. This is actually an NIR sensor called the, the Harvest Lab sensor, which is mounted on the spout of a self-propelled forage harvester. So if you're harvesting forage, for example, that sensor is giving information about mass, how much crop am I harvesting, and moisture. What's the moisture content of that particular crop? So you combine that information about mass and moisture with your GPS position, and we create um, what's called documentation maps in the cab. So what, what you'll see is as you drive through the field with the, with the GS3 display, you, if you're using documentation, you'll see these maps being created that show agronomic information. So yield, a harvest operation, you may see yield, uh, mass, volume, moisture. For a seeding operation, you may think, see things like seeding rate. How often are you placing data, plant, or seeds in the ground? Um, and for spraying, you may say things like spray rate and application, um, different application attributes. And for tillage, for example, you may see um, depth that you are actually tilling the ground. Um, I have a question right now that says, what does NIR stand for with the sensor? Sorry, but thank you. Um, sorry, I introduced an acronym. We have lots of acronyms in this space, it seems. NIR is, is similar to remote sensing. It's a um, particular wavelength. It's an it's a imaging sensor, so it uses near-infrared, um, similar to what you would see with an aerial image um, that may be true color. We actually use a, a near-infrared band to calculate and, and capture um, mass and moisture information. So thank you for the thank you for the question there. And then I have another question: that do the sensors come programmed to pick up certain parameters, or are they programmable? 
Currently, they're programmed. There's specific parameters that we should then and then um, capture. But we we often get customer feedback about new um, parameters that are important, and then we try to integrate those into the products. Um, the other the other feature that I'm showing down here is called uh, shapefile conversion. I thought that might be interesting to this group. So one of the things that I'll talk about later is some of the standards within the ag space for precision ag data, and, and honestly, there really aren't many standards today. Um, one of the things that we do allow is the grower to upload what's called a, a shapefile. I'm sure you're all familiar with a shapefile. So you can actually import a shapefile that represents your field in what's called a prescription. And I'll get into this a little bit later, but, but what that shapefile allows you to do is describe your field in zones or polygons in your field, and we actually will be able to adjust um, machine functions based on that. So that kind of leads into my next, um, the, the next area. Actually, I'll, before I get there, I was gonna, I'll talk about a couple other displays in the CAD. Um, the next display I wanted to mention, this was just recently announced in the, in the spring here, was what we call Seedstar Mobile. It's actually an iPad, a mobile device. It's actually an iPad app. And there's a link here if you wanna go see the press release or the video. So this is, I talked about the ruggedized embedded display. This actually complements that display and allows the customer to bring in the iPad during a planting operation for specific makes and models of our planters. We have a, a new planter, it's called it with exact emerge um, or max emerge row units. Those row units now provide us row by row or individual, I think this is a 24 row planter that's shown here on the screen in this image. We actually get for every single row unit, um, five a second, we're getting data from those row units. And it's information about um, planter settings, um, um, planter settings about planting rate, about depth. So we're getting very specific um, high frequency data coming across from the planters and it helps the producers visualize and document their planting operation. And they can also um, diagnose, diagnose potential problems. If there's an individual row unit that might be having problems where previously it's very difficult to visually, as you're planting, to turn around and see some of those things happen, it's easier to actually see those alerts on the map itself. And so um, and there's some videos out there that actually show how this works. But what you'll see is there's a, um, this is color coded. And there are map legends up here that show um, seed rate, depth, different performance settings. And the map will actually, this map doesn't show much variation, I just realized, but you'll see some light yellow spots or maybe a bright red spot when something, there's an alert or something is wrong. Um, say seed spacing went below your a certain threshold, you'll see um, on the map an indication of this problem. So then the data, the nice thing about having the iPad in the cab is we can then send the data directly to what's called myjohndeer.com. And so Seedstar Mobile allows you to use either your own cell connection on the iPad or you can log the data and then when you get back um, to your office, you can actually send that data over Wi-Fi. So the iPad just makes the data a little more, a little more mobile. You can bring the data with you and you can move the data um, by just using the iPad itself. And actually, um, this is the group that I now work for. So I'm in this um, mobile group. It's called, called Onboard Applications. So this is really where I'm, I'm focusing a lot of my time these days. I just wanted to comment on a couple other in-cab data collection um, efforts. I probably should have moved this slide up one, but essentially this slide is showing one of an, an example of a, a another sensor that can be added to our equipment it's called mobile weather and you can see the weather station that's mounted on top of a sprayer so what we do is um, allow the customers to mount this weather station mobile weather station and as they spray you can see an example of the sprayer here very large booms and as it gets um, as you're in the cab it's difficult to tell how windy it is outside or maybe what what conditions are changing in terms of temperature and humidity, and really what this impacts is the effectiveness of the spray application. And so there's certain 
Um, I'm not an agronomist, so I don't have much background in this area, but there are certain conditions where the product itself does not um, work well or doesn't work as as um, as recommended or as expected when when weather conditions aren't favorable. So this allows the customer in the cab to real time see the 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 um, the weather and 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 the the temperature and see how that impacts their ap actual spray application. That information is also then documented, and I'll get into the use of the data as you get um, back to the office. So some other just data collection type applications. Like I said, we're moving. We do have a lot of mobile applications as well. Um, we have one for crop scouting where you can go out and um, take a picture of weeds, for example, or and so it takes your um, GPS location from the phone. So this gets the um, GPS that maybe is a bit lower accuracy than some of the um, in-field operations, but it does allow you to use your GPS location from your mobile device and capture information about weeds or pests or just typical crop scouting type operations. And then we also have um, an application around soil sampling to be able to go out and take a grid soil sample, for example, um, if you capture a point location, GPS location, and some information or soil sample in the field, we can tie that together to create maps. So the next section I'm going to get into is how we use some of this data for um, equipment control within the field. So, so I've talked about the, the high accuracy GPS and the in-cab displays. Next I'll talk about how we can use those two um, pieces of hardware to actually control um, both the equipment itself for guidance and then also how we apply products in the field. So first I'll talk about swath control. So swath control is a product that uses, um, based on your GPS location, your current GPS location, and your pre or the previous area that you drove, in the in-cab display, we keep track of what's called coverage or, or a driven area. So this um, image here to the right, you see these dark blue lines. That indicates that, or dark blue areas, that indicates that the customer has already driven over that area. And you can think about in, in, a, in a case where you're planting a crop, it's bare soil. So it's very difficult to see where you planted in the past and where um, where you've planted and where you haven't planted, essentially. So the map um, actually gives a really nice indication of where you've already planted. And then when you drive over an area that you have already planted, what we do is we send a control message back to the planter that says shut off the planter row units. And so what this does is it reduces seed cost. Um, it actually increases yield. You think about um, this is extra seed that's being planted. The picture to the left here shows an operation where you were not using swath control. And the picture to the right shows swath control. Essentially what happens is the planter itself didn't turn off, you double planted in that area. And the plants are actually competing for nutrients in the ground and, and so number one, you're planting more seed than you need to and then number two, the plants compete for that nutrients and they don't yield as well. And then the other thing is it just reduces operator fatigue. They don't have to worry about turning on and off the planter. It does the turning on and off of the planter for, for, the, for the producer, the driver. And then there's just less risk in those planting errors. So what you can see is the image to the right is where swath control shut these sections um, or row units off during planting and you don't have that double planted area at the end of the rows. So there's different settings that you can um, control. If you want to minimize overlap and minimize skips, for example, there are different settings that the, that the, that the producer can actually um, change to make this fit the way their operation, they would prefer their operation to work. They may want some level of overlap. Some actually prefer to have a little bit of overlap. And this may depend on if you're, you have a spray operation or a planting operation. So I'm showing a spraying, a planting operation right now. But you can imagine this is really valuable in something like a spraying operation where it is really difficult to see where you've sprayed. And so it's really important to um, do things like outline waterways or um, drive around um, 
a stream, for example, so that you don't spray into areas um, that you don't want to spray. Or things like um, if you have a neighbor's field that maybe doesn't have a, a fence to delineate that boundary, you can upload things like field boundaries, and that's this, actually this pink line right here. So the overlap control will control to both where you previously drove and also will also control to field boundaries. And, and um, the customer can keep out of those field boundaries or I would say swath control will keep out of those field boundaries for the customer. And Jill, with that swath control, um, does the tractor then have like also an automated steering type system yeah. so that it That's will actually steer and follow the boundary? I'll get to that next. Um, okay. We don't actually follow the boundary, but we do follow tracks and lines. So, yep, I'll, I'll go over that as well. Good question. Um, so, like I mentioned before, in in, um, in terms of how we vary, so we can turn, we can control sections on and off. We can actually control also the rates that go into the ground. So, we allow the user to create what's called prescriptions, and prescriptions is a um, an example of that is on this this screen here. Management zones within your field. So you can assign rates to these. So let's say that you wanted to per, um, plant 32,000 seeds per acre in this light brown area and 32,000 seeds per acre in this other area. These prescription maps actually, when loaded into our display, um, based on your current location and where you're at within that prescription, we will send a message to control the planter to only plant those particular rates. So again, you know, it, it reduces input costs, it improves yield, and it, it reduces things like runoff and um, better, more precise management of, of placing the products into the ground. So we have some other products around um, topography management. We have what's called Surface Water Pro and iGrade. So this is more managing um, the land itself and grading the land so that you have better um, 3D elevation. Um, a lot of growers do this today. You'll see people um, managing things like levees or ditches. Um, so what these products do is allow you to drive a very highly accurate three-dimensional survey of your field. And then once that survey is in the field, this is an example of what this looks like. You can see the profile of a particular path that you may be driving. And what we do is um, if the tractor using pulling a, um, a grader, for example, would want to adjust the blade based on a particular slope, what this does is allows you to um, set a plane or a grade. And as the tractor drives, we actually control the blade for the for the grower, so they don't have to visually um, control the the grade itself. Um, it uses the feedback, um, like I said, your current position and the, the three-dimensional surface that was created to adjust the blade and, and then adjust um, the cut in the field. So then um, to Mickey's point, we do also have what's called guidance and machine control, and there's a whole section of this out on the, on the web page. I, I didn't include too much on this, but really what this does is it allows us to use your the GPS location and your um, your GPS stream, and what it allows to do with uh, allows the customer to do um, are there's different functions. One is called auto track. What auto track lets you do is the customer will drive the first pass in a field, and you see these very straight rows. Um, the customer drives that very very first line. Based on that line, um, we then create auto track lines within the field. So this white line here is the current line that they're driving. The display then calculates where is the next pass, given your your implement width and, and how you need to um, where that next pass might be. And then we will actually steer the tractor, so we take control of um, the steering. And so when the customer turns around, they'll snap onto the next auto track line. Once that auto track is engaged, then the um, steering control actually happens for the grower. So so they no longer um, once in auto track, they do not need to touch the steering wheel, it will steer for them. So that gives us pass-to-pass -pass steering. It doesn't have to be a complete straight line. They can drive what's called a, a curve track or a circle track or an adaptive curve, which is a free-form type 
Um, I should have had some pictures of that in here, I guess. Um, some freeform steering, that the, but the user does have to define those passes. And then um, another thing that we'll do is there's a product called iTech Pro that actually does, so we do the steering within the field. What iTech Pro will do is actually steer or turn the vehicle at the end of the row. So um, with I, Auto Track, you actually have to make the turns for the for the vehicle. With iTech Pro, it will do the turns for you. So it's complete, you know, hands-free type operation. You do have to have somebody in the seat, however. So there is there is some requirements around that for safety. Then there's Auto Track Row Sense, which this is actually there's some sensors or feelers on the head of a combine that helps um, in cases where you may have down, corn or crops that have fallen down in the, um, maybe there was hail, a hail event or wind event that has, has um, knocked down um, specifically corn. This allows, it's a combination of the GPS information and then sensing of those the, the corn stocks. It keeps the machine um, harvesting in the location that it needs to. And one other product that I mentioned here is Machine Sync. What this um, is primarily during a harvest operation, there's a Machine Sync allows communication between the combine that's harvesting and a grain cart, which may be used, which would be used to unload the combine. And so essentially, what happens is as the combine drives and the grain cart approaches, the two sync, they communicate, and essentially they they the the grain cart steering is controlled by the combine's location. And that way they're, they, they can drive completely side by side and both drivers do not need to steer the equipment. So now we'll get into some of the, the field operation analysis. I know we've got, it looks like 20 minutes left. So we'll try to reserve some time at the end for questions, additional questions. Um, in terms of field operation, we've talked about the data as it's logged in, in the cab. You see in our 2630 display is a USB port where a, a user can insert a USB stick and download the data. They can then upload that um, to a desktop software called Apex that, that um, Deere publishes. There's also several other um, what's called FMIS or farm management softwares that, that um, are developed throughout the industry and there are files can be consumed by many of those um, other desktop softwares. But the whole idea with APEX is to create a field operation or summary reports. It looks like a, you see here the um, you know GIS map and then some summary about, this is a yield map for example, some summary about the overall field statistics and crop characteristics. So one, one means of getting data there is through a USB stick. Another means of data is called wireless data transfer and I'll talk about that in a moment. But essentially, um, there is another means of getting data um, wirelessly to these systems. So, and just kind of show a few pictures of APEX, and I'm sure being GIS professionals, you're familiar with, you know, map layering. Um, so in this case, you see an aerial image with, um, with a yield map. In the yield map, the grower can change the number of classes and how they classify the data and how they create those map legends. And then we also do some, some spatial analysis within the tool as well. We have um, what's called raster interpolation. And this particular, actually to the customer, it's called contours. But behind the scenes, it's doing raster interpolation. So in this particular case, when, when the customer clicks, um, selects to create a contour map, it's taking all the point locations that were logged in the field and doing a uh, IDW interpolation, raster interpolation to create a zone map. And so um, the customer does have some control over IDW and, and how large their cell sizes are or, um, or the, you know, the power that's used in IDW. So there, the, I showed this screen here because there are some settings. But, but to be honest, I think a lot of our customers will use the defaults. And so we kind of have some routines here to set a default um, that maybe makes the most sense for creating management zones. So then what they do is instead of having um, this detailed yield map, you'll get more of a um, zones or patterns within the field. So this is the same yield map in a uh, presented as a contour map or as a raster. And what you start to see is pockets of high yielding areas, maybe pockets of lower yielding areas. 
that map can then be used as what we talked about before, the prescription in the field. And so the customer can actually assign rates to each one of those polygons and change how they apply products within the field. They can also use things like a soil map. So in this example, we use the USDA service to pull down the, um, the Sergo soils. And so the user can take those soil zones and again, um, create a prescription, add rates, and then actually send that as a prescription to the field. So we have One a question the, too here. Oh, okay. Um, the question was, uh, is this proprietary or built on open source? And I think they're probably talking about the Apex software that oh. John Deere has. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I can, I don't, I'm not sure if I can um, speak to that. Uh, we use some open source elements. Um, this is proprietary. I, I mean, a Deere, you know, sells the software. Um, the, the formats themselves, I'll get into that actually when we talk about data exchange. Um, for now, right now it is a proprietary format, although we uh, provide tools to the industry, only because there isn't an ag um, standard around formats. So we do provide tools to translate the, the files. So um, good question. The software itself is, is sort of a mixture, um, and I'm and I'm not sure. I, I can't speak to what I guess it's used, what's used behind the scenes today. But but I will talk about the formats here when we get to that section. It's a good question. Um, and, and you probably have the question about my John Deere, if that is the question. So. So the next piece, I, want, I talked about the desktop software. We also have a web software called myjohndeer.com. So this is probably a little more than um, the Apex's, you know, the mapping and, and reports. There's more um, management of your overall operation on My John Deere. So things like um, your equipment information and your production data, your farm operations, um, you know, having more access to the equipment type information is available through My John Deere. And so as part of my John Deere, this was called an operations center. This was just announced um, recently. Similar to Apex, you can get your yield maps online. And they're starting to do things like um, what we call multi-year um, comparisons. This is an example of you can see three years worth of yield data sort of stacked together. And you can get um, more of a um, multi-year comparison of yield and maybe see some more patterns that maybe have occurred over time versus a single year's worth of um, worth of data. And um, there's also some other tools that are within that MyGenDeer site and they're more for logistics type management. There's one called JD Link, which allows you um, given telematics uh, devices in, in the cab, which would be a, a cellular enabled telematics device. Most of our newer makes and models have this cell device. Actually include things like your current location and you can get directions to a piece of equipment or you can send a message to a, a ping, a current machine. It also allows us to do things like um, remote machine management and allows the dealer to, to service or, or provide service to a customer remote. So a dealer given that they've subscribed to Daily Link and they have service advisor remote enabled, the dealers can actually um, log into their systems and maybe set things up for them or, or make configuration changes for the customer. And then um, AgLogic is more of a fleet management, and so this would be a lot, a lot of our ag service providers. Um, there may be a contract provider that is, for example, spraying uh, multiple customers. They can use this tool to track their assets and dispatch, send, you know, dispatch work orders to send equipment and files to field. And that can that is tracked through there's a device that's in the cab and then there's also um, through my John Deere web pages where you can see the, the equipment. Uh, Jill on the slide previous to that last one, there was a question that says uh, you know, how can this help with managing crop rotations? And I think that was showing the yearly yields and stuff. Yes, absolutely. Really good question. Um, so there's a couple different ways that we do that. So um, by providing those tools, the customers themselves can make that decision. Um, you know, they can look at how, for example, different crops performed over different years, and they can make the decisions themselves, or we enable some APIs, developer.deer.com, 
um, we provide APIs for agronomists to get that same data. So if, if I'm a customer and I'm working with a specific agronomist who's making those recommendations for me, we can um, send the data to the agronomist. So my John Deere is really enabling some of this data sharing um, to both your agronomist, to your ag service provider, um, so that if, if you're not the one making the decision, you can quickly get the data to somebody who may make that decision for you or help you make those decisions. And is this correct that, you know, if you got a low yielding area, it might be where you might want to plant something a little different there um, because it maybe over the years the nutrients have been taken out of that area by that same type of crop. So that's why you look at a crop rotation there. Exactly. Yep, that's that's exactly right. Um, so so um, in terms of, you know, looking at this variability within the field, you can do things like vary the um, – Let's say you are putting down a fertilizer application and maybe there's certain areas you would like to target more than others. That's exactly where, you know, looking at data like this and comparisons of yield over the years, a lot of growers or producers can, can make those decisions. They, they sort of know their fields fairly well and just talking from, from my own personal experience, you know, we know our fields fairly well or we think, we think we know. We know what areas would yield maybe better than others, but having data like this to really truly make decisions and make zones that you can then apply or change rates um, and you don't have to do it manually really takes a lot of um, burden off of the off the producer. So yeah, using using information like this definitely helps um, make some of those decisions. Last piece of thought, I'll try to go through this fairly quickly. Um, I was just going to point at some industry efforts that have been going on to standardize ag data exchange. So as I mentioned earlier, they're really, um, as I, when I started in 2006 at, at John Deere, it was interesting. There's a lot of data formats floating out there, but there was no specific standard format. And, and um, so one of the recent efforts in 2010, the Ag, ag Gateway is a nonprofit consortium, and it's businesses across the ag supply chain. So it's everything from manufacturers like John Deere and Agco and Kloss um, to, to seed providers like a Monsanto or a Pioneer um, or, I'm sorry, um, product um, suppliers and manufacturers. So, so it's very nice that it's a sort of a broad reach across the ag and food supply chain. And a project was kicked off a couple years called SPADE, Standardized Precision Ag Data Exchange. The product, project objectives are really um, to you know, promote with a goal of, of um, promoting our efficient operations, we want to be able to share and, and trade this data um, easily within farmers and other companies. And so we're really working towards creating a common language across the companies and equipment manufacturers. And so what we did was we started the project by looking at what standards were out in the industry today, see if there was a standard and maybe a reason why we weren't using it, identify any gaps, and then work towards a uh, um, a standard. So there's quite a few companies you can see on this list that are participating and really ultimately what we're, what we're looking to do is um, enable this data exchange from a farm management system which would be like the GIS systems, the Apex and the MyJohn Deere that I showed there to other FMIS systems. I mentioned the agronomist or an ag service provider that may also want to use similar data. And then also things like common identifiers for products. Um, a seed identification. This is for traceability of products. Um, you can think about a, a bag of seed that may have a barcode, for example. That's something, and it has a unique identifier. It's something that's not necessarily traced in our systems today, and we'd like to get that reference data from the seed and chemical providers and, and crop types from USDA. So we're working on a, clearing, a data clearinghouse. And then Enabling that data exchange also enables things like that crop plan that I showed, the prescription. Um, being able to get that prescription from, maybe it is from your um, agronomist FMIS system. So a recommendation, a prescription, a work order. And at the end of the day, there's supposed to be some animation on this and it's not showing up for some reason, but at the end of the day, a lot of this information also is used for crop reporting to the government. So to the FSA and the NRCS and the RMA, and they've also been involved in this project as well. So I would say that you know it's evolving. The SPADE project has definitely helped move that along. 
There's also some ISO standards. So there's, there are some standards in terms of how the equipment reads this data. And we're really not changing anything in that standard space, but we are asking ISO to add some additional information that maybe was not in the standard when we, when we started the project. So um, one other project, and I, and I probably will just touch on this very quickly, and there's another project called the Con Conversion Toolbox Proof of Concept. And essentially, because there are these different formats in the industry today, I mentioned John Deere provides um, a, a converter utility to, to convert any legacy or um, um, existing formats, this 2630 format, to um, this industry standard. This is a project that we're working on today that, that um, a company like John Deere as an MICS, it's the display, the acronym for the display, a would provide a plug-in to this toolbox, and it essentially makes it eliminates the need for companies to know various data formats, and we can support these formats. So the, we, we had a proof of concept um, at the early part of the year. Actually, it started in November of last year, and then in the spring of this year, in May, we actually tested this at what's called the ISO Plug Fest, and we demonstrated the ability to exchange data between our systems and get the information onto a display in CAB and actually control um, ISO implements. And so the way that this works is all of the companies come together, this is in Lincoln, Nebraska, and um, at a specific table you have the, the displays and the controllers and the farm management systems. And this is showing uh, my John Deere X, an export that's running on a CNH display with an Ag Leader liquid controller. So what you see is it's not a 2630 display, it's another display. Um, I think this is a TopCon display. You see a field boundary and you see a um, pull behind sprayer driving and sections turning on and off. So we want to try to promote you know, this data exchange and, and have some common ways of communicating data. So I think that's the last one. I've got five minutes left. I see a couple of questions left here. Mickey, should I start with those? Yep, uh, there's one about you know, can the Green Star 3 system import data from non-John Deere brand NDVI and soil sensors? That's, that's a good question. If um, for NDVI, currently, I believe the only one we support is the, um, is the Harvest Lab sensor. Um, there are some ISO sensors that are back to that ISO communication. Um, depending on the compatibility, we do communicate with some ISO controllers. So this kind of goes back to ISO and the level of, um, there's different certification levels. So if the controller itself is at a certain certification, there is the ability for our display to communicate with it. But right now, in terms of the NIR sensor that I showed, Harvest Lab is the only um, NIR sensor that we that we use. And maybe related to that, can any, can your equipment actually be put on a tractor that is not a John Deere? Right. Yes, actually we can. There's a, and there's a whole section on that. It's called Universal. So there's certain makes and models that it, um, if you go out to the website under Auto Track, for example, you can mount, as long as you have our um, GPS equipment and the display, you can mount that in a red tractor, for example, and there's certain makes and models that are supported. Okay, and then there's another question that says, what data privacy is provided for the user of Apex or myjohndeer.com? Is data shared without permission, et cetera? Good question. There's a whole section, I believe, out there about, about um, our policy around data and privacy. So it, the underlining statement is the grower's data is the grower's data. Um, they make decisions about who they send the data to. So um, Deer uh, does not, you know, they make the decision if they want to send it to their agronomist. So that's not up to Deer to do, and the Deer and the user actually has different settings that they can change to control um, who has access to the data. So, for example, if you don't want your John Deere dealer seeing your data, you absolutely do not have to show that. So they, you know, Deer has been around for 100 and you know 76 years, and and the idea is that that you know, the grower's trust is more important to us than the grower's data. But the whole section on privacy there as well. And then we had another question, uh, this is from Heather, it says, how has the reception been in, in the end users? Uh, 
you know, do the crop managers trust the technology? Yeah, that's that's a good question. In terms of, um, and maybe I might ask Heather to elaborate that in terms of the technology for the machine control type tech technology, or is it more from recommendation? Yeah, machine yeah. control. Good question. Um, you know, when I started here in 2006, um, AutoTrack was kind of the first, um, I would say, machine control product out out the door, and you know, there was a lot of question about steering the equipment and, and controlling the equipment, you know, how will people accept this? And it has been extremely um, positive and very widely adopted. And so I can just, you know, just from the number of products that have sort of evolved, at least since from my time being here at um, ISG, it really speaks to, um, you know, the need that the, the growers are, are really asking for a lot of this technology. So it's, it's been really exciting to see that change over the years. And you've probably seen that more maybe with the high yield type crops then probably where a lot of this has been implemented or yes absolutely just more control over over the and, and more precise you know placement of the products more control over of what you place and and less manual effort for the customer to actually do that themselves So yeah, I, I think we're getting close to the end of our time, but if there are any other questions, I think Mickey, you've got my contact information. Feel free to um, you know, send some, some other questions to Mickey as well, and I think he's going to make this presentation available. And again, most of this is out on, on our website. Um, more information out there than I, than I provided today, I just tried to touch on those products that were specific to GIS. And Jill, there's one more question, and then we'll wrap it up here, and uh, that was uh, from Bill Johnson here, have there been any ROI studies done on these systems? So like return on investment. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sure there have. I don't I don't know off the top of my head. In fact, I know there there were some return on investment for sloth control, and in fact I think it's on the web page. So for sloth control, um, the the cost of the activation versus the the cost of unnecessary seed placement or product placement, I guess, seed or chemical placement, the return on investment is, is very um, easy to calculate. I think there's a calculator out there on the Stellar. And I, I can send that to Mickey if I can find it. I'll send that off. All right. Well, thank you, Jill, very much for presenting today. It was very informative and learned a lot about what's going on Great. in the egg, egg industry. And appreciate everybody else sitting in uh, on the webinar today and also don't forget renewals for the New York State GS Association membership are due here in July and uh, if you are not a member being a member really helps out with putting on webinars like like these and it's only ten dollars a year so all right well thank you very much everybody and um, with that I'm gonna keep the webinar up here just a little bit because as people close out you can be prompted for a little quick survey so I'll leave this uh, session up and running for a little bit and then shut it down here in a few minutes. And with that, Jill, thank you very much again for presenting and and we appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you, Mickey, for the opportunity and thank you to the associates.